Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. It's uh, certainly a pleasure and an honor to be speaking here, especially when the, the introduction says that there's going to be the next revolution in economics is going to be from social and moral psychology. Yes, uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, and when the speaker before me is Joe Henrik, who is one of the people that I've learned uh, the most from. This, these are uh, three extremely influential books in my thinking, uh, beginning with uh, some of Joe's advisors. Um, well, Pete Richardson and Rob Boyd began to develop this set of ideas that Joe has really taken, taken so far into understanding uh, what is the basis of human cooperation. And so uh, Joe and I just exchanged our PowerPoint talks last night, and you will be amazed at how well they fit together. Those of you who are hoping for a debate or an argument will be sorely disappointed, but we might be able to sort of put ourselves together to really come up with what is it that, that in our thinking about public policy and nations and international and supranational organizations, what is it we're not seeing? What is it we're not getting? Why, are things, why do things seem to be falling apart? And I think if you put our two talks together, I think we're going to make some progress, which will continue tomorrow uh, with the even darker stuff about why nations fail and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, you know, Joe, Joe included this slide here. I, I love his approach of starting with human nature. We're apes, but we're apes with culture who have kinship. And then the church comes. So this kind of approach of start with the, really the, the basics of evolved human nature and then build in how that plays out in different institutions and changes over time is a really great approach to thinking about development and history. And that's what I'll be doing here. Um, but I'm really pleased that I get to out Henrik Henrik. That is, Joe said, Let's go back really far. Let's go back 5 million years. That's nothing. Let's go back 5 billion years. Let's go back before there was an Earth. Further back. Let's go back 12 billion years. Let's go back 15 billion years. I want to take you back to the very beginning of the universe. Now, after the Big Bang, now, okay, now what does this have to do with human nature? You'll see. After the Big Bang, there's a period in which there's nothing, or at least there's no matter, OK? There's just energy. There's no matter. And then uh, uh, as things cool, matter begins to form and condense, and then eventually we get life. Um, so cosmologists are beginning to know, or, 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 you know some, to some degree what, what happened. And as they've learned over the last century, as they've come to see how this process played out, they noticed a curious thing, which is that there are about 20 or 25 constants uh, in our universe. What does it mean to be a constant? It means that in our universe, you know, the charge of an electron or the, 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 you know, the weak force of this, or the, you know, those things you learned in high school physics. In our universe, they're set a certain way. But what it means to be a constant is that in another universe, they could be set differently. Well, in our universe, these things are set. But if a, for a few of them, if they were 1% or 2% different, matter would not have congealed. There would not be any life. And this has led some people, including Stephen Hawking, to say, the laws of science contain many fundamental numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And then he says, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Well, that is pretty provocative. That's interesting. What do we make of that? Well, some people have made of it this, that maybe God did the adjusting. God, and this is the deist conception of God that the American founding fathers held, that God chose the constants, set up the universe, started it going, and then he doesn't intervene. But God created the universe. Now, I'm not using this as a literal story about how we got here, but it makes an incredibly good metaphor, which goes like this. I'd like to propose to you a parallel hypothesis, which I call the finely tuned liberal democracy hypothesis. And it is, as Joe said, we are tribal primates evolved for life in small fish and fusion societies with intense animistic religion and violent intergroup conflict. That's human nature. Now, <clears throat> we have evolved into larger groups. We've lived in large secular democracies. But I'd like to propose to you that our species is unsuited for life in large, diverse, secular societies. We're not good at it. We're not made for it. It's not likely to work unless, unless you get certain settings finally adjusted to make possible the development of stable political life, to just amend Hawking's phrase. That's the hypothesis. I don't know that it's true, but I think that it is. <coughs> now, you don't have to come to this hypothesis. I just put E.O. Wilson there, but others have said this sort of thing um, as, uh, about human nature. 
you don't have to come to this view from evolution. The founding fathers came to this view from studying history. So in the Federalist Papers, you, you see their debates and their discussions. Um, they read a lot of, of uh, especially Greek and Roman history. Uh, they knew that democracies had a terrible track record, which is why they didn't give us one. They did not like democracy. They did not think it would work. Uh, they described various failings of democracies. Now here they're talking about direct democracy especially. And then Madison says, after describing some of the problems of passions and do majorities dominating minorities, he says, hence it is that such democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. So if you see the founding fathers in Philadelphia knowing this and, and trying to come up with a mechanism that won't fall prey to this history, the sad history of ancient democracies, well, now we can look at the founding fathers <laughs> as engaged in this great project of intelligent design. They were trying to intelligently design a democracy, just as one might try to design a clock that could run for a million years. It could perhaps be done, but there's not a lot of margin for error. And so what they were doing in Philadelphia was trying to come up with a clock, a constitutional, a constitutional system that would be consonant with human nature and its vicissitudes. That's what they were doing. Now, um, they gave us the longest lived uh, uh, liberal democracy in, in human history, as far as I know. Uh, but how's it going? How are things working out for us today? It seems as though there's, there's oh, I don't know, a specter haunting liberal democracies, as Ricardo put it. Um, they seem to be malfunctioning or showing certain problems, not just in America, but parallel problems in many, as Ricardo showed in his slides, and as we all know from reading the newspaper. The reason why I came up with this metaphor, the fine-tuned liberal democracy, is that the intensity of the problems and the similarity and the speed with which it's happening makes me feel as though somebody has reached in to human nature or human society and changed like the, the, the charge on the electron. Or, or maybe they took the gravitational force and they multiplied it by 100. And suddenly it's like galaxies are spinning out of control. I mean, if you change the gravitational force by 100, the whole universe would be in chaos, or it would change very quickly. Now, for societies, who could do this? Who could possibly reach in and change the physical constant, or the social constants? I think there's only one person, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> Not that he literally did this or this was in his intent. But if you, if, you, if you follow the story that Joe told, and then you say, well, what if we were to increase connectivity of people by a hundredfold in the space of three years? I don't know. Let's try it. And that's what we did. Um, so uh, obviously, I don't have to run through this. Ricardo already ran through it. All kinds of stuff is happening just in the last few years. It's not just America. It's in Europe. It's, it's also in some non-Western countries as well. Um, and it wasn't just especially in 2016, 2017. Uh, this was just a month ago. And then this was this morning's headline, a story today in The Guardian. I just pasted it in, in here. Political divisions in Europe are like a civil war. So something's going wrong. We need to understand why. And I think this is the big challenge for the social sciences in this decade and possibly this century. It's not going to be the century of robotics and AI. It's going to be the century of social science and the study of societies and democracies, I think. Um, now, is, is it just that it's a problem of globalization and the haves and the have-nots? That's what economists tend to say uh, in Britain and in America. Uh, but many of us working in this area say, well, yeah, economics has a lot to do with it, but it's half the story, I think less than half the story. Um, so I tried to tell a story that is really, it turns out, to be all about the, the sentiments of us, the sentiments of, of groups. Um, two years ago, I had an article in the American Interest uh, that I'd like to just very briefly run through. The, it's a, basically a story of what's happened to us in four steps. Let me just run through that, and that's my talk, and then we'll be in a good position to, to talk about what's going wrong or what to do next. So um, usually, in a group like this, especially a group, I mean, what are we together for? What do we call the global empowerment something? Um, so usually, a group like this is going to say, what's wrong with those people? Our job is to understand those people who just hate people who are different. They just hate them. And we're going to try to understand them so we can manipulate them better and get them back to our, support our projects, right? That's what we're all here to do. So I'm going to say, well, let's look at us first. Let's try to understand us. How did we come about? Because we are the freaks of nature. And here, Joe's paper, The Weirdest People in the World, is about 
people who are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Those societies, those are the freaks of human history. Not that they're bad, but they're very unusual. That's what needs explaining, not the nationalists. So let's explain us. Step one, the rise of the globalists. Uh, this, I think, is the most important graph in the world, certainly for the, uh, not just economics, but for the social sciences. This is GDP per capita in all the major continents uh, from the year one through um, here through 1950, so Western Europe goes you know, way up from you know, $1.50 a day to $3 a day in 1500, mercantile capitalism and then colonialism, but that's nothing compared to the Industrial Revolution. The United States really masters the craft and creates the first middle class society. Look what's happened by 1950, uh, dwarfs everything that happened before. I love this graph based on the Angus Madison data because you sort of see the slow rise and then what's happened since 1950 dwarfs everything that happened before 1950. And, it, and, this, and this ends in 2001, Madison's data set. Obviously China and India are way up here now. So this graph explains the transformation of our world, the transformation of human life in the last one or two centuries. Um, it leads to all kinds of wonderful things happening. Overall, things are getting better for billions of people. Poverty is plummeting. All sorts of good things are happening on a global scale, according to these books, and I think they're right overall. But some interesting things happen when we get rich and, and safe. Uh, the World Value Survey, which has already been mentioned, is our best source of uh, uh, information on how countries are changing. I won't explain it. Most of you know what it is, but basically a giant global survey uh, of uh, 95 countries, a bu bunch of value questions. And when you take the average score on these value questions for each country, and then you just let the computer do a multidimensional scaling, uh, putting countries near each other that have similar values, here's what you get. If you can't read, I'll just, yeah, I won't, well, basically, um, Protestant Europe, Scandinavia is in the upper right, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, the United States is here, uh, Latin America is down here. So all these countries are actually pretty far to the side on self-expression values compared to survival values, but they vary along this vertical dimension because Scandinavia is very secular, rational, whereas America and Latin America are much more religious. Of course, if you took just San Francisco and New York, and, and Cambridge, they'd be up there with Sweden, and the rest of the country would be there, which is important for our story. Um, uh, but, but here's what I think is so interesting about, about this map. When I really got into it a couple years ago, uh, as I'm trying to write a, a book on capitalism and morality, um, what I come to see is so interesting is that all the countries down here are poor, of course. So traditional survival values are what the values you have when you can't count on there being food in a couple of months and you need to have strong local alliances and kinship systems. So all the countries down here are poor. These are especially the, the Muslim countries and the African countries. All the countries up there are rich. That's Protestant Europe. So you might think, you might think that it goes like this. Agricultural societies are like this, but as they get richer, they move up that way. That would be a common sense thought, but that's not what they find. The, the, um, the people who run the World Value Survey find that a general trajectory is more like this. Agricultural societies have values down here, but when they make the transition from agriculture to industry, and they have to now fit with the machines, not the cycle of the seasons that take rituals to bring the rain, but now you have to fit with the, the machine schedule. So uh, you develop more secular, rational values. This, I think, is what Karl Marx saw in London when he saw the early Industrial Revolution in, in um, Manchester. Um, is that people, everybody was just going for money. It was ugly, the loss of traditional ways, but it was just very materialistic. So you get these materialistic values up here. But then after a few generations, their grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren join the service economy. And for the service economy, you have to have people skills. You have to be able to work with people, persuade people, sell to people. So the general trajectory is actually like this, which is very, very interesting. You can see this happening if you look at the Confucian countries. So. Uh, here's China, Taiwan, South Korea, um, so, uh, and here's Japan. Now, of course, Japan is, is in a league of its own. Japan was the first non-Western country, not by a little bit, but by many, many decades. Japan industrialized very quickly, and sure enough, Japan is two or three generations closer to Sweden than is China, Korea, or Taiwan. I'm not saying they're going to end up at Sweden, but they might. That's op that's, we don't know. They're on the way. So this is what's been happening to values as we get richer and safer. And here's the quote. Here's the really important quote that really just, uh, uh, I just, I, I practically have this pinned to my wall as I think about uh, uh, cross-national psychology. From this book uh, by Christian Welzel, who's one of the people who runs the World Value Survey, um, they say, 
fading existential pressures, that is, when you no longer have to worry about there being food in a few months, when you no longer have to worry about your kids being dead in a year, fading existential pressures open people's minds, making them prioritize freedom over security, autonomy over authority, diversity over uniformity, and creativity over discipline. Well, that sounds great, right? That sounds like progress. That sounds like us in this room. That's what we are. That's what we value. Uh, and this is especially common in the cosmopolitan elite um, that you get a new moral worldview. You get globalism. Let me show you. Oh, here's, here's the globalist anthem. If you ever get confused as to what we believe, and again, I'm doing this in quotes because we don't know, but what the globalists believe, just go to this. Imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. If we could just get rid of all that stuff, we'd all live together in peace, right? We'd all live as one. That's the globalist dream. Um, let me show you some data. Here's what globalists believe. So I run a research site at yourmorals.org. You can go there, take a bunch of surveys, uh, uh, learn about your moral values and things like that. One survey we have up there is called the Identification with All Humanity Scale. It's got questions like this. How much would you say you care, that is feel upset, want to help, how much would you say you care when bad things happen to people in my community, my country, or people anywhere in the world? On a scale of one to five or one to seven, whatever it is. How much? Um, how close do you feel to people in those three groups? How often do you use the word we to refer? To. So this is, these are the sorts of things Joe was saying. It's not cooperation versus non-cooperation. It's the sort of the local versus the local personal versus the more global impersonal. Here's the data. When people come to the site, they register and they say whether they're very conservative, very liberal, progressive. Um, and so people who say that they're very conservative are parochial. That is, they say that they say we more often for people in their community or country than for people elsewhere in the world. Okay, that's a definition of parochial. There's nothing wrong with it. It's kind of sensible and rational. Um, so people who are conservatives are nationalists. They care more about people in their country than people far away. People who are moderate are not nationalists. They, give the, they care equally about everybody. You could make a case for that. But how can you make a case for this? How can you make a logical, rational, moral, or philosophical case that you should care more, use the word we more, et cetera, et cetera, for people in the world in general than people in your community or country? What can that even mean? It means you're a new kind of person. It means your brain, no, your brain, your mind has been changed. You're a globalist. Um, you might not even like your country, especially if your country is not in Scandinavia. <laughs> so to summarize chapter one, um, a set of innovations that first came together in Europe, and here I mean democratic capitalism, uh, banking, trade, all the, the, the uh, uh, corporate law, all the things that came together to create that gigantic upsurge in wealth and prosperity, gave us these wonderful, peaceful societies um, and, okay, uh, peace and prosperity then change values, minds, and cultures. We get a new kind of person, a globalist, cosmopolitan, uh, what David Goodhart calls an anywhere versus a somewhere. We're all anywheres in this room. It doesn't, we, we can be from anywhere, and we're, we can plunk us down anywhere. So that's chapter one. The others will go faster. Because um, what happens when you get such a society? Lots and lots of people want to move there. So uh, for as long as we have records, when there's uh, hunger in one place and food in another, people want to move there. They're hungry. They go where the food or the, or the possibilities of prosperity are. Uh, it was true in the Bible. It's true. This is uh, Irish immigrants uh, departing Liverpool for North America. Uh, and this is the percent foreign born in the United States. In the late, late 19th century, it was very, very high. Then there were immigration restrictions. It becomes very, very low in the late 20th century. And then those restrictions were lifted in the 60s. And now it, it, it's uh, much higher. So we have, a much, we have a, a, another peak in percentage foreign born in the United States. Same thing is happening in Europe. Much more, more recently, this is the map from two years ago. This is from uh, immigration in 2015 as a result of the various uh, of ISIS spreading throughout the Middle East, uh, of the war in Syria, starve, hunger, uh, people, especially a few years ago, long lines of people uh, walking, to, walking to Europe. 
Um, and Germany, of course, famously opened its arms, opened its gates, uh, and had an, uh, took in an enormous number of immigrants from, uh, from Middle Eastern countries. This is the total European. This is the part that went to Germany. Um, and what did it do? A gigantic left-right split. On the left, this is wonderful movie stars, Susan Sarandon, so, uh, going, you know, somehow she's out there just as they're arriving. And they amazingly, there was a photographer there who actually caught, he's caught the moment <laughs> that, um, okay. Not a um, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I'll, I'll skip this quote. But the point is that globalists generally believe that patriotism is racism. Patriotism is a bad thing. Um, nationalists, in contrast, are patriotic, and they really, really hate the anti-patriotism of the globalists. Um, so this is why you get the constant battles, not just in America, but in France, and Sweden, and Denmark. You get them everywhere, or all over Europe, um, over burkinis, over clothing. Um, over In Sweden, they, they uh, implemented uh, uh, um, gendered swimming hours, which is very contrary to Sweden's uh, gender, uh, gender equality norms. Um, a, a poll on a conservative website, a poll found that a, more, a majority of Americans don't want to press one for English. Please tell me more about how you came to our country and now want us to change our traditions because they offend you. Um, so there's a lot of resentment by the nationalists for the globalists. Um, so summary, summarizing this chapter, once you get this amazing wealth, opportunity, cosmopolitan values, it not just attracts immigration, but it welcomes it which sets up a conflict with the nationalists. So chapter three, the authoritarian alarm. Um, here I really recommend to you work by Karen Stenner. She's a political scientist, wrote this wonderful book in 2005, The Authoritarian Dynamic. Uh, and then she kind of dropped out of the academic world for a while. And um, while the academic world or the political world came around to basically exemplify everything she said in this book. Um, what she says is that authoritarianism is not, so authoritarian, we know that these things go together. People are morally, politically, and racially intolerant. Those things go together. What Stenner shows us is that it's not a stable trade. It's not that some people have that and others don't. It's a predisposition. Some people have a personality that is like that only when they perceive normative threat, that is a threat to the moral order. The three major forms of normative threat are disobedience to group authorities, if there's widespread insurrections, nonconformity to group norms, lack of consensus and group values, the sense of diversity run amok. That's a good way to really activate the authoritarians and, and push them into political activity to oppose you. Uh, this is exactly what Richard Nixon did. This was his playbook in 1968 with the chaos in the streets, and it worked for him. Donald Trump literally copied, Paul Manafort admitted that they actually looked back at Nixon's uh, uh, speeches to model Donald Trump's uh, acceptance speech. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation, with, even though it has the lowest crime rate in decades, will soon come to an end, begin, et cetera. So um, he didn't say the part about the, I put that in. Um, and it's happening in Scandinavia, too. It's happening in a lot of countries where there is a high levels of Muslim immigration and uh, group organizations on the right that want to call attention to this. Um, and so in, there's often a backlash against immigrants since 2015, 2016. So uh, that's chapter three. Um, all populations contain multiple personality types. There's always some possibility of normative threat. And when this happens, we get this reaction. But I want to note, the reaction is not selfish. It's groupish. It's tribal. This is what a tribal ape does. A tribal ape that, can, that wants trade, wants exposure, can do openness, but is pretty quick to slam the gates down under certain circumstances. Chapter four, what now? Um, Stenner gives us, I think, a, a really important piece of advice here. She says, we can best limit intolerance of difference by parading, talking about, and applauding our sameness. Ultimately, nothing inspires greater tolerance from the intolerant than an abundance of common and unifying beliefs, practices, rituals, institutions, and processes. This is essentially what Joe, well, Joe said pretty much this in one of his slides. You, you have the ethnic psychology, the kinship, kinship psychology, the shared norms. There's all sorts of things you can do to create this large society. But if you don't do any of them, good luck. Uh, and regrettably, nothing is more certain to provoke increased expression of their latent predispositions of authoritarianism than the likes of multicultural education, bilingual policies, and non-assimilation. So to sum this all up, if you think about small-scale societies are very solid and stable, built on these psychological foundations Joe told you about. 
And then we found ways to create these gigantic accumulations of people. And we can do these gigantic societies. But they're always subject to centripetal forces blowing it out. And centrip yeah, I'm sorry, centrifugal forces are the ones pulling it out. And centripetal forces pulling us in. You have to pay attention to the balance between them. And if society has a surfeit, a surplus of centrifugal force and very weak centripetal forces, what do you think is going to happen? So if you have a very large country with linguistic diversity, a short history, has cultural or religious diversity, high levels of immigration, especially from parts of that map I showed you that are very different. So not Norwegians living in Stockholm, but people from the Middle East moving to Stockholm. If you have high levels of that, it's fine to have low levels. If you have high levels, it's going to be a centrifugal force. Um, and if you have conflict within the nation, as we do in this country, you've got a very strong forces there. Um, so just a little framework to organize our thoughts and our discussion about this. Um, uh, so, since 2016, I think more and more people are beginning to recognize that the EU project uh, was at least insufficiently aware of these psychological processes. As Donald Tusk said, it is us who today are responsible. Obsessed with the idea of instant and total integration, we fail to notice that ordinary people, the citizens of Europe, do not share our Euro enthusiasm. So what now? I think the globalists uh, need to at least understand their compatriots. It can never hurt to understand. Uh, patriotism is not the same thing as racism. And there are healthy forms of patriotism and even nationalism. There are malignant forms, too. Um, uh, and I think that immigration, we really need to talk openly about immigration. It's very hard to talk about because of the nature of the political forces at work on professors, on the academy, on researchers. Uh, but mass immigration has mixed effects. It has, uh, you know, the economists tell us it's generally good. I totally believe that. Um, but it has a variety of effects for social cohesion and trust. Uh, and we need to at least consider what kind of immigration policies would have the, the best ratio of good to bad effects. So uh, that is my talk. These are the, the four chapters of the story of how we got to where we are now. Um, I'll leave you with just, again, to come back to this, that clearly we can, we can do large-scale liberal democracies. We've done it. But there may be a very small margin of error, and we might be outside of that margin. And that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs>